We've got to wake up the, the, the masses to what the issues are because, you know, you kind of get back to your life and you think, hey, you know, things are like they always were. You know, we're still watching our favorite TV shows. We're still watching the Cowboys and the Chiefs and the Super Bowls coming. And uh, we're still going to go to the lake this summer. And kind of, you know, er everything's like it was. No, it's not. Um, we've got a generation in trouble here. And we can't put our head in the sand. <laughs>Today is the host of Dr. Phil and author of the new book, We've Got Issues, How You Can Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. Dr. Phil McGraw, welcome to the Rubin Report. So glad to be here. Uh, people who haven't been li listening the last few minutes know how glad I am to be here. We, we had some technical dif difficulties. Let's see if we can work it through. Uh, I actually want to start the show on, on a bit of a personal note because when I was a struggling stand-up comic <clears throat> in New York City, early 2000s, I didn't have 20 cents in my pocket, and just life was just out of whack and not quite going right. Somehow I started watching your weekly appearances on Oprah. I think they were on Fridays, if I'm not mistaken. And it was, you were basically just like, get over your shit, get your stuff together. <laughs> and it kind of got through to me, and I don't even really remember what a lot of my stuff was. Uh, but you kind of helped me get on the right path, and uh, I'm happy to happy to tell you thank you. And here we are. <laughs> so it works. It's I funny how it life. Worked. It's funny how life works, isn't it? Comes full circle. It, it really is. It really is. Why don't, why don't we start? Just I mean, everybody knows who you are, but you want to give like a one minute Dr. Phil life recap for the people who don't, and then we'll get into some of the the more pressing issues of the day. Well, um, you know, I, I started doing Oprah. That's when uh, I met you because I was, uh, I had a company called Courtroom Sciences, which we did trial work, all kinds of litigation support work. Um, and that's how I met her. She had been sued in mm -hmm. the Mad Cow case in uh, Amarillo and uh, for over $3 billion. And so they brought me and my company in to help with that case. We did jury selection, trial strategy, all kinds of uh, graphics, witness prep, and uh, all different kinds of things. And that's how I met her. Uh, we spent, uh, in fact, we lived together in a bed and breakfast up in Amarillo for several months. A uh, new sister I never wanted, but I uh, <laughs> got to know Oprah really, really well. And uh, she ultimately got me to come on to her show and then it turned into every Tuesday, actually, is what it was. And I did that for about five years. And uh, right after I started doing it, she said, listen, if you ever want to do your own show, just tell me and we'll work it out. And I never did go to her and say, I want to do my own show. And then one day I was walking through the building at Harpo and she said, hey, dummy, come in here. <laughs> I said, OK, I came in and she said, hey, it's time. You know, 80 percent of our mail is for you. And uh <laughs> One day a week's not enough anymore. You need to do your own show. And uh, so we actually launched the show the next year. And uh, I did a 21-year run at uh, CBS Paramount out in uh, L.A. And uh, then decided I wanted to do my own network. So that's where I am now uh, in Dallas. Uh, we've just launched, uh, well, actually we'll launch on February 26th, Merritt Street Media. 24 hours, seven day a week network. And uh, the uh, anchor of it will be Dr. Phil Primetime. And uh, we're gonna have news, 24 hours, seven day a week network. We'll have four hours a day of news, then my show and a lot of other original programming. Couldn't be more excited. What would you say the thrust of the of the network is? I mean, obviously there's, there's a lot of networks out there, a lot of news out there. So what's gonna make this unique? Well, you know, I, th I think what I think is going to make it unique is it, it's all going to kind of follow the value system that I've tried to develop over the last 25 years on the air, uh, which I think has resonated. I think it's what made my show number one in the genre for so long, and that is creating a, a, a value system that is really family-oriented and very straight, like you say. I, I just kind of tell people the truth as I see it. And I'm not the repository of all knowledge. And if what I say won't stand up to challenge, then hit the eject button and move on. But mm -hmm. 
uh, I think people in this country are sick to death of spin, 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 spin. Everywhere you turn, you you tune in. There's some facts in there, but it's mostly an agenda that's being pushed on people. And I think they're underestimating the viewer. I think people want to just tell me what happened. Let me make up my mind about whether it's good news or bad news, how it relates to me, what it means for my family. And uh, I think family in America is really under attack. I think this country is under attack and somebody needs to stand up and push back against some of this craziness. And that's what this network is going to be all about. We're going to be very fact-based, very empirically based, uh, and embracing the science. And that's what I do, and that's what this network is going to do. Do you remember a moment when it all started to go awry, uh, not only just with <clears throat> things not being fact-based, but the sort of emotions over everything else? And I guess since, I I've, do. Seen, since I've seen you deal with so many uh, young people who are out of whack, w when they sort of just lost their ability to see things clearly? <clears throat> you know, Dave, that is such a smart question uh, because if you look back across time and, and look at the human experience, when we had the Industrial Revolution, everything changed. Uh, you know, back in the 1800s, we were 95% an agrarian economy. Mm -hmm. Everybody worked on the farm, right? Mm -hmm. It was agriculture. That's what we did. Um, and then it started to change a bit. When And then uh, now it's like 1%. Why? Because everything got mechanized. Everything was, the Industrial Revolution changed everything. It went from 95% to 1%. 1% of people work on farms right now, and those are mechanized. And the biggest change that's happened to the human race since the Industrial Revolution happened in 08, 09. And that's when it was like big, it seems like big airplanes flew over the country and dropped smartphones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And think about it. Everybody started walking around with a computer in their hand. And enough computing power, particularly you, you look at these i iPads and all, there's more computing power in this iPad I'm holding right now than we had when we did the moonshot, yep. when we put a man on the moon. And what happened is everybody went from going through life like this to going through life like this. And young people stopped living their lives and started watching people live their lives. And here's the problem. The lives they were watching being lived were fictions, fantasies, produced and created, and they were comparing their life to those fantasy lives, and as a result, they started feeling inferior, and their self-esteem went down, and it started interfering with family dynamics. People stopped having dinner together. Mm -hmm. They stopped talking to each other. They were all on those phones watching what was going on. It changed the world. And look, technology's great. I, I think it's great. But there were unintended consequences that changed how people live their lives. At, at 16, I remember when I was 15 years, 364 days old, I was standing outside the DMV waiting to get my driver's license. <laughs> Not anymore. They, I mean, six, they don't even get their driver's licenses at 16 anymore. They start, they date later. They have sex later. They, they get all of these things that we used to see as, as big developmental watersheds. They're slow to do those things. And sure enough, it was about that time that we saw spikes in depression, yep. anxiety, and loneliness higher than at any time since they've been keeping records because they stopped living and started watching people live. It changed everything. That's when I think this world started going crazy. And if I can ramble some more. Yeah, please, come uh, on. <laughs> uh, seriously, what happened is some of these crazy ideas, conspiracy theories and weird ideas, you know, it used to be you could be maybe on a farm in Nebraska or something and have some weird idea. <laughs> it would spread as far as people you ran into. But now with the internet, it gets oxygen so it can spread all over the country. This stuff didn't used to have such legs because it didn't have enough oxygen to breathe and spread. Now you can get on the internet and sell all kinds of crap. We've got 10,000 cults operating in the United States because of the internet. 
So, so you're talking about a whole bunch of things that I focus on this show. I mean, social media, we were supposed to make us more social and it actually made us more anti-social. But the truth is everyone watching this right now either has this thing in their pocket or they're, they're watching on this thing. So what do you do to fight that? Because I'm not anti-technology either, uh, but this thing has become so ubiquitous in society and broken so many brains uh, that it, it seems like we, we are unable to uh, deal with it, I suppose, in a mature way, as even as you and I as adults, much less the 15-year-old that's handed the world and said, okay, have at it. Yeah. And look, I'm glad there's technology. I mean, but we got to start using it rather than abusing it. Um, kids don't even know what a library anymore, what it is anymore. It's a big building with books in it for those that don't know. <laughs> because you can go on Google or these search engines and instantly you can pull something up. But what they don't know is that everything they read on Google is not necessarily correct. Yeah. Um, because nobody's vetting that stuff. And you, you can, and let me tell you, it's getting ready to get a hell of a lot worse because this AI and deep fakes, um, I, I saw an ad the other day of, of me selling some product and it was me talking in my voice with yeah. my countenance and I've never heard of this product. I don't know what it is, never heard of it, but yet it was me in my voice talking what's going to happen with the election coming up we're when it gets too late to be rebutted i think we're going to see candidates saying crazy things making admissions that they're not really making uh changing positions are not really changing in enough time to get to the voters but not in enough time for them to say hey that's not me i, I think we're moving into a dangerous dangerous time because AI and deep fakes uh, are going to have a lot of misuse. So I think we've just got to inspire people to start becoming more critical thinkers, verifying things through known outlets. And that's going to take a whole uh, effort to get people to start thinking differently and acting differently. And that's one of the things that I'm talking about. Um, and think about how much things have changed since I started. On, when I started doing the Dr. Phil show, not even just when I started Oprah, when I started doing the Dr. Phil show, the first text message had never been sent. Hmm. Never been, there were no social media platforms. Yeah. The, the internet was not ubiquitous. And then I had to start adapting to that because cyberbullying didn't exist. And all of a sudden I had to start figuring out how do we inoculate kids to cyberbullying? I've had to go before Congress and testify about adding funds to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act to deal with cyberbullying because kids were hanging themselves in their closets back in their bedroom because they couldn't escape the bullies the way you used to when you could at least go home and mm -hmm. be safe. So everything is changing across time and somebody's got to talk about this. Uh, I did a show last week about sextortion because young men are getting suckered into sending nude photos to what they think is some young girl mm -hmm. that they have never had a, an interaction with, sends them what they think is a nude photo. So they say, well, I'm not going to blow this. They send one back and boom, somebody says, hey, I'm not a 14 year old naked girl, right? but now I've got your picture and you pay me $10,000, $25,000, or I'm sending your picture to your parents, your pastor, everybody in your contact list. I've got your school yearbook. I'm going to humiliate you if you don't pay. And some of these kids immediately commit suicide because they're so humiliated. To some extent, do you miss the old days of doing the show and dealing with problems that were a little more granule or at least a little more connected with people in their own body, their own problems, their own families, kind of the simple stuff before, <clears throat> say, that 2008, 2009 threshold. You know, it was a simpler time, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I, I certainly don't get bored because <laughs> about the time I think, man, I've seen it all, I open up a show book and go, no, I haven't, because <laughs> they're very creative. And now, as I say, I'm going to have to figure out how to deal. I, I, I talked to a woman yesterday on the show 
that was in a love scam and spent several hundred thousand dollars. And I said, you know, tell me how they they conned you on this. And she said, I actually spoke to him. And I said, well, I understand. She said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm, I'm talking live on Skype. I, I actually talked, and it was a deep fake. They had wow. stolen some good-looking guy's information off of Facebook and created a deep fake, and she was actually speaking to the guy. I mean, who wouldn't fall for it? Uh, and it was a, an, an elderly woman, lonely, husband had died, and you know, here's somebody that says, oh, hey, I, I love you, baby. Uh, help me get home, and we'll be rich together. And sure enough, took her for every penny she had. So you have two, two words in the title of the book, or in the subtitle, actually, that, that I use on this show all the time, soul and sanity. And, and I always tell people it seems like we're more in a spiritual battle at the moment than a political battle. Everyone thinks it's a political battle between these two, <clears throat> these two old timers. I, I don't really think that is what it's about. It's about that sort of loss of truth and what the algorithms have done to us and the confusion over social media. Uh, but can you talk about those two words a little bit, soul and sanity? What, what, what does soul mean to you first? Well, I'll have to say what it doesn't mean, and I, and I don't talk politics, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I don't know a damn thing about it. I'm, and well, that doesn't I don't stop anybody most, on CNN. Come on. I, I just started to say, I think most of the people that talk about it don't know a damn thing about it either. At least I'm honest about it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know anything about politics, and I'm not being, you know, that's not false humility. I really don't know anything about politics. I can read a bill like anybody else, um, and most people don't read the bills they talk about either. Um, but I, I really don't want to bog myself down um, in the geopolitical aspects of what's going on. I don't want to get into the, the gridlock of Washington. I think what I'm focused on are the cultural issues. Mm -hmm. And it's the culture that determines the outcome of a society. And somebody much smarter than I said that probably over 100 years ago. Um, and that's what I'm interested in. And when I say the soul of America, I I'm talking about the real core of what defines this country, the core values that we don't think about every day, but are at the center of what defines America. The morality, the, 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 the North Star that drives us in the direction that we've been driven for 250 years. And I think the backbone of America is the family unit. And it's under attack. Some of it's unintended consequences by this technology we've been talking about where mm -hmm. nobody has dinner together anymore and if they're in a car riding together, they're all on their phones or video games or whatever instead of talking to each other and learning each other. Um, I, I saw a study the other day that said uh, most young people, teenagers, 16, 17, 18, have less, on average, have less than one good friend. Hmm. Uh, they, they got tens of thousands of likes and clicks and, and followers, but they have less than one good friend on average. And that's what I mean by the soul of America. What's made us a, a great shining example on the hill that everybody wants to come be part of uh, is eroding because we're not interacting anymore. We're not embracing those values anymore. And I want people to get back to that. And the sanity is, look, we, in, in this book, I, I'll, and I'll send you a copy of it, and uh, um, maybe on a long flight you can look at it somewhere. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I think we're under attack from what I call the tyranny of the fringe. Um, it's not even the minorities. It's the fringe way out on the edges. We've got these people that, I don't even think speak for who they say they're speaking for. They're the ones that are way out on the edge taking radical positions that don't represent the main thought of the group they say they represent that are driving these bizarre agendas. And 
we've got to come together and push back against that. And they they take these radical positions and they flat out lie. Uh, they've written articles about me where they say, oh, Dr. Phil has now become a safe place for right-wing haters. Oh, I've been there. And I've been there. They go, oh man, they go down through with this article and say, he had on this right-wing hater, this right-wing hater, this right-wing hater. And what they don't mention is sitting right across from them was their left-wing counterpart. They actually lie by telling half of the story because they don't want free speech, they want their speech. And so they're gonna try to label me a hater and cancel me. You're gonna find that a lot harder to do than you think because I don't have the need to be loved by strangers and I'm just gonna keep coming. I don't give a shit what you say. <laughs> Well, I have a couple of things to say of that. First off, I think you'll appreciate the fact that my, bre my best friend on this, war on this planet, we met the first day we were four years old, first day of kindergarten, and now we're both 47 years old. So that goes to the friend part. And in, ter <laughs> and in terms of the, and, and by the way, that then connects you to a whole bunch of stuff because you're connected to something that you remember from a long time ago. But as far you as bet. the who, who you interview thing, me and Jordan Peterson, who I know you're familiar with, and Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell were once on the cover of the Sunday New York Times saying that we were the leaders of the alt-right because we've talked to some of these people. So yeah. I'm with you, man. I am past giving a shit on all that stuff. But, yeah. but what do you make of the people that folded in the face of this? So you know, I know we can always make fun of Gen Z and all the young people that are confused about all this stuff, but what about the adults that were supposed to stand up and, and say the type of types of things that you've been saying for many decades and, and not <clears throat> hand the world to these people, to the fringe people? Well, you know, I, I think there's a lot of pressure and I, I did something this summer that really opened my eyes. And you know, I like to think I'm pretty much in tune with what people are thinking and how they're thinking. And about the time I think I'm pretty smart, I find out how much I don't know. <laughs> um, I was going to give a, a talk at one of these billionaire retreats at a ski resort in the summer, you know, where they get all these uh, rich folk together and, mm -hmm. and uh, have these retreats. And I was invited to come be a keynote speaker at one of these things. And um, I knew that they were all pretty conservative and thought a lot like I did. And I thought, well, you know, this is going to be like preaching to the choir. You know, I'm going to go up there and talk for 45 minutes. They're going to give me a golf clap mm -hmm. and uh, say thanks and I'll leave. And I thought, you know, what the hell, I'll, I'll, I'll go do it. Um, so I, I go up to do this. And two and a half hours later, I finally said, hey, I, I got to stop. I, I'm about to wet my pants. <laughs> um, and, and what I found is that I was right. They did agree with a lot of what I was saying, but they didn't know why. Like I, I was talking about, you know, we're, our kids are spending too much time on social media and it's causing them to get depressed and have low self-esteem, et cetera. And they agreed with that, but they didn't know why. Mm -hmm. And when I started explaining to them that these algorithms are targeting them with content that upsets them, not content that interests them, but, t but content that gets them agitated and upset because that makes them start clicking and clicking harder and clicking harder and clicking harder. And if, if it's somebody that says, I need to lose weight, then before you know it, they're feeding them uh, pro-anorexia sites, mm -hmm. 400 calorie diets, uh, all these things that are really bad for their health. Um, and and they're targeting them for that sort of thing, then they started going, wait a minute, you're telling me that they're exploiting my daughter's, 14-year-old daughter's mental health knowing that it upsets her, knowing that it creates anxiety, knowing that it damages her mental health, and they're doing that purposely so she will click more and they get more ad money uh, and I'm like, yeah. And I'm, I'm looking out there and they're writing on napkins. They're writing on each other. They're taking <laughs> notes. 
they wanted to know how to fight back against their friends that are pushing on them. I think a lot of people people folded because they didn't have the facts to fight back. And I want to give them the fight the facts to fight back with. What do you make when you talk about the tyranny of the fringe? I think the big one for most people these days is is the gender confusion and that so many kids are going through this. It seems like uh, it disproportionately affects young girls that, you know, quote unquote transition to, to boys. Um, what do you make about the social contagion part of that? Because obviously you're talking about social media, but that there's a pressure, <clears throat> there's a pressure part of it that never existed in the old days. You might've just been a Tom girl and grown up and maybe I suppose you probably would end up be a lesbian, maybe, but maybe you weren't. There are girls that act kind of boyish and then they marry guys, but that this thing has just been fed and fed and fed. Well, uh, one of the things that bothers me is when you look at this gender affirming care, um, uh, that's like the names they give these bills um, in in uh, Washington, D.C., which just kill me, the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and then they go in with $34 trillion debt and decide to add another $7 trillion on top of it or Inflation something. Inflation Reduction um, Act. Yeah, Inflation Reduction Act, yeah. Uh, 30, th 300 economists sign a letter that said this isn't going to have anything to do with inflation, <laughs> but they still call it that and, and put it out there. Gender affirming care is um, uh, really interesting that it what they're actually talking about is um, sex change operations and uh, hormonal treatment that, that some of these chemicals are what they use to chemically castrate uh, chronic pedophiles in prison. Uh, and they're giving them to uh, early teens to um, to arrest their development. I, I think that um, what's happening is they're denying a contagion effect. But the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Endocrine Society, uh, the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association have all signed off. Mm -hmm in support of gender affirming care. Now, I don't know of any other uh, condition or treatment uh, that they have ever signed off on, maybe the vaccines, that they've ever signed off on with less information about long-term impact mm -hmm. uh, in the history of, of medicine. Um, but they've, they've all signed off on this. And and in in Europe, Finland, Sweden, uh, the UK, uh, they've stopped doing it. I, I, I cited study after study after study where they've tracked hundreds of uh, subjects that they've done this um, suppression treatment with and said, didn't work, didn't solve the comorbid conditions mm -hmm. that go along with it. So they've just stopped doing it. But yet all of our medical associations are signing off on it and they're denying that there's a contagion effect. Um, with girls, this has gone up hundreds of percent in the last few years, but yet they deny contagion effect. Um, that's just absolutely not true. And look, People can do what they want to do, but when you're talking about children, right. the, f the first thing is do no harm, and they have no evidence that they are doing no harm. Let, well, let me put it this way. They don't have evidence that they're doing no harm, mm -hmm. and that's the standard to which they should hold themselves, and I don't think history is going to be kind. Um, well, not if not if the right side wins, I suppose, right? I mean, not if we get things back in order. I think a lot of these people are going to be looked at as butchers. Well, I think if you look at if you if you track these people long term, if you look at what's happened in Europe, um, the the suicidal rate, the detransition rates are going to suggest that history's not going to be kind. But of course, the AMA says, hey, it's good. Of course, they are the group that suggested smoking to control your anxiety at one time. So 
this is an advocacy group. I don't think they're necessarily following the science, and I think they should. Let me, let me, let's shift for a second, because you mentioned you're not particularly political, but I've seen you host a bunch of different debates with all sorts of people, some, some people that I'm friends with and that I know, talking about race and some of the political issues of the day and gender and a whole bunch more. And I wonder, do, do you think that fundamentally that this is just about ideas that people either got right or wrong, or do you think fundamentally people are wired differently? When you see people that kind of accept facts for facts and reality as it is, versus someone else that, that sees something just purely from their own perspective. Do you think that's just like an idea confusion, or do you think it's people, we're all wired differently. Some of us are run hot, some run cold, some, you know, a whole, a whole series of things. You know, I think some people have been trained in critical thinking, and I think others want to be accepted. And I, I think that if you get into identity politics, I think a lot of people start with one idea and they say, you know, I, I can support this idea, but then they don't realize that there's a whole agenda that this group supports. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, I agreed with this one thing, but now I find out that they're doing all of this other stuff. They have all these other points on their agenda. And now I've kind of signed on. And if, if, I, if I resist that or I ask about it, um, I'm going to get targeted. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be calling my job, my church. They're going to assassinate my character on the Internet. And I think a lot of people are saying, look, this is just trouble I don't want. And, and I think that makes it just easier not to push back. And, you know, someone, not me, I've, I've repeated this, but I'm not the first one that, that said it. Um, you know, I, I would rather have questions I can't answer than answers I can't question. Mm -hmm. And right now, that's where we are. We have answers that we can't question or we're labeled racist or phobic or haters. And people are saying, look, I just want to live my life. But that's gotten to prove, it's gotten to prove very expensive in terms of our culture, our society, our schools. And I think people have to find the resolve to say, I'm not going to be silent just so other people aren't upset. I got to be willing to push back. Do you, do you think any of the answers come from our institutions and from our systems, or do you think that's all just reverting back to, you know, doing the family thing right and the community right and everything else? Like, to me, it's like we're not going to get any, uh, a, you know, real answers or any real retribution. Let's say on COVID. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that the government clearly is lying to us about that I don't think will be resolved that maybe, and that's why I would say it's more of a spiritual war, <clears> you just have to disconnect and figure out how to live your life the right way. Well, I've been um, very much quoted as saying that I think some of our elite universities are doing nothing but creating intellectual rot. Mm -hmm. um, in our young people right now. They're not teaching critical thinking. For God's sakes, we've got universities that are sponsoring anti-Semitic groups on campus. I mean, at first they were saying they were pro-Palestinian. Now they're actually, they, they don't even go through that charade. They're now just saying they're pro-Hamas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I saw a the other day that, that said gays for Palestine. Uh, yeah, I tell you what, take that banner and walk into Gaza and see how that goes. Gays for uh, Palestine is a little different than Palestine for gays. Yeah, you're not going to have a very nice walk through the Gaza Strip with that banner. They don't even teach them, look, they would kill you in a heartbeat. They would throw you off of a building over there. I had the son of one of the co-founders of Hamas mm -hmm. on the show, and he said they would kill you before you got out of your car, and you're supporting these people, you're rallying these people, and a, a, a lot of what bothers me and this is what I mean about culture, not political, is how much our lives are impacted 
by the government, but not people we elected. I'm talking about bureaucrats that have too much power and too much control. We saw that happen with COVID. And let me tell you what I mean, if you want me to. I, sure. I'm, I'm talking too much. Hey, you're, you're being interviewed, man. Go for it. Yeah. Well, all right, look, I, I said that we saw a spike in 08, 09, and 10 of the highest levels of depression, anxiety, and loneliness we've ever seen. All right, who keeps those records? Well, the Department of Education, the CDC, some of these agencies, not with elected heads, but with appointed heads. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, I point that out because they're the ones that do those measures. They're the ones that have those numbers and report the fact that our young people are really struggling mental health-wise. So we know they have that information. Those are the same people that when COVID hit, shut down the schools. Mm -hmm. All right, now, they shut down the schools, and at first they said, we're going to shut down the schools for a couple of weeks while we, got our while we get our bearings. And I'm like, yeah, I, okay, I get it. You know, this, this is a new strain of something. They got, they got to figure this out, so they'll take a couple of weeks and figure this out. Okay, then a couple of weeks turns into a couple of months, and then a couple, then, then it turns into a year, then it turns into 18 months, then it turns into two years. Now, who shut this down for two years? The same people that have the numbers that say our young people are in a mental health crisis with high levels of anxiety, depression, and loneliness. The same people that know they need to be engaged at school. The same people that know that half of our referrals for child abuse and molestation come from mandated reporters at school, mm. and we're going to shut that down and abandon these kids and lock them up with their abusers at home. And sure enough, referrals dropped as much as 50% nationwide because mandated reporters didn't have their eyes on these kids anymore. And so these kids who are already depressed and anxious and need this interaction at school, need the competition of school, need the socialization of school, they yank that out from under them and leave them isolated and at home for two years. And what do they say? They say, well, we did the best we could with what we had. No, you didn't. Mm -hmm. No, you didn't. Mm -hmm. You knew what you were doing, and you knew they weren't at risk from that virus, but you had a new hammer, and everything looked like a nail, and you shut it all down and left them out there twisting in the wind. And that's what drives me crazy. So tell me how we get out of it. How do we get out of that? We have a, we have, I mean, you're basically describing the deep state that there's this perpetual thing that has information on us that seemingly can lock us down. I'm afraid that they're gonna do it again, that people, everyone right now, it's cool to be like, <clears throat> ah, you know, I wasn't really for it, but they'll come back and say, oh, it's 10 times as deadly and, or, or it's something else altogether and people will fall for all the same things again. So, so what's the inoculation there? I'm just waiting for the next one to come around the corner and you know, by the way, I didn't say this after the fact. I said this at the time. When this first started, I went on the air publicly multiple times and said that the damage that will happen psychologically, mentally, and emotionally will exceed the damage from the virus itself. And they all said I was a crazy man. I was a heretic. And when that all came true, how many of them you think said, hey, we want you to come on so we can apologize? I know. Zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Zero. I'm not vaxxed. I was getting kicked out of TV stations and everything else. And I was in crazy LA and couldn't go to restaurants and all the rest of it. And yeah, you don't get the apologies, but I suspect you'd be in a different line of work if you were looking for the apology, right? Yeah, I don't have the need to be loved by strangers. So that works out just fine for me. But I, I, I am concerned what's going to happen when it, when it occurs again and they start playing this same game again. But we haven't, we've done some things to close the educational gap. Uh, we're still way behind. And our epidemic pediatric, uh, uh, pediatric, 
pediatric epidemiologist suggests that we may have lost as much as 15 million years of life lost uh, because of what happened there, because there'll be more dropouts, they'll get less sophisticated jobs, which means poorer uh, health care, which means slower diagnosis, less quality care, so diseases will kick in earlier in their lives and they won't have the life expectancy that they would have if they'd gotten better education, better health care, earlier detection, better treatment. Um, All of those things are problems. Now we've closed the gap some, but we're still behind in math, we're still behind in science, we're still behind in English, uh, and we're not doing enough to close that gap. We've We've gotta bring in Uh, tutors, teachers, programs uh, to close those gaps so these kids aren't left behind. I got one more for you, Dr. Phil, which is so seeing that the problems and the issues that you've been talking about for decades now have scaled up and they're algorithmically charged and everything else because of this thing, um, what what gives you hope that we can actually get on the other side of this and and get back to uh, some of the things you write about in the book? Well, we've got to wake up the, the, the masses to what the issues are because you know you kind of get back to your life and you think hey you know things are like they always were you know we're still watching our favorite tv shows we're still watching the cowboys and the chiefs and the super bowls coming and uh we're still going to go to the lake this summer and kind of you know er everything's like it was no it's not um we've got a generation in trouble here and we can't put our head in the sand we've got to say look Um, you're electing the people um, that are precipitating these problems and it starts from the bottom of the ticket up. You can go in and say, who am I going to vote for for president? You know, you got to, you got to start from the bottom of the ticket up and say, you know, if if you're concerned that, you know, some lady over two blocks over got uh, mauled by a couple of pit bulls that were running around without anybody, uh, have them want a leash or under control, then you better look and see if the dog catcher's doing their job. Start paying attention from the bottom of the ticket up. If you're concerned that you've got judges that are not uh, holding people in jail when they should, mm-hmm. you got DAs that aren't prosecuting, you got to find out who that you have a chance to vote on is doing the job you want and who's not. Your vote can count if you will actually Uh, pay attention to how they're doing the job you're electing them to do. The biggest con out there is, hey, just vote. No, don't just vote. Make an informed vote. Find out who's doing the job you want and who isn't. I don't care if you think it's Republican or Democrat. Find out who's doing the job you want and vote your conscience about whether they're doing what you think should be done in your community and vote from the bottom up. Dr. Phil, I thank you for your time. The book is We've Got Issues, and I suspect this could be like a 10-volume set because the issues ain't going anywhere, so I look forward to doing this again. It's like the old Encyclopedia Britannica, (laughs) right? Just get get all 26 of them. We've got issues. Thanks, Dr. Phil. It was great talking to you. Dave, it's great talking to you. Thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop screaming, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.